good evening and thank you for being here today with us. I am Amit Saxena along with Dr. Deepika Chabra from Medical Services Department of Jackson Bar Pharmaceuticals would like to extend a warm welcome to all AOGD Delhi PG Forum case discussion on infertility by postgraduates of UCMS and GTB Hospital Delhi with academic partner Jackson Bar Pharmaceuticals, makers of Lightweight, Maintain, and Divatron. We thank you all for this opportunity to connect with us today through this webinar and proud to present Divatron 10 milligram tablet, fully indigenized micronized diatrogestron, the only brand having 36 months of shelf life. Jackson Park would like to express gratitude and extend warm wished welcome to the experts and attendees. Please use Q&A box or chat box to post your questions, suggestions. You can share the WhatsApp link posted on the chat to help spread the word about this webinar. We now request Dr. Coordinator Delhi PG Forum, Dr. Sunita Malik Madam and Coordinator Delhi PG Forum, Dr. Shivani Ma'am, Shivani Agarwal Madam to kindly initiate this proceedings. Thank you, Amit, and thank you, Dr. Deepika, for uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, the PG Forum case discussion on infertility. Uh, so as we know, uh, the infertility, you know, the incidence of infertility is rising uh, in uh, our country. Earlier, we used to say, okay, no, no, we are overpopulating, we are producing so many children, but uh it's uh, what i found in, in any hospital any type of population you know i was in sabdajang we used to have an uh, infertility division then now i shifted to esi hospital and then it, uh, i thought they are young patients maybe infertility but i found the incidence is still high their reason may be different in different population maybe age with late marriage late childbirth or maybe some post infectious diseases, tubal factor, and so many factors are there. So today's class is on infertility, which is going to be discussed by UCMS and uh, GTP Hospital postgraduate Preeti and Maua. And uh, before starting, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Aspita Rathor to say a few words, which as all of you know that she is the president of AOGT and the HOD director professor of Mulan Azad Medical College with interest in uh, um fetal medicine and she's got many publications and books written in her name uh so over to dr asmita you'd like to say something good evening and uh, at the outset i would like to thank dr sunita and dr shivani as a coordinator for this delhi pg forum over the last one year now as a OGD president we are completing our tenure and this will be the last pg forum during our tenure and i think it was really a wonderful journey with both of them as a coordinator and interacting with many postgraduates and experts over a period of year. My special thanks to Team Jackson Paul for being with us and supporting this program and I am sure they will continue to do with this in future also. Uh, regarding today's topic, as Dr. Sunida rightly pointed out, infertility is a very common problem and for which all postgraduates must have an updated knowledge. The today's uh, cases are going to be presented by Dr. Preeti and Dr. Bahu, uh, Dr. Mahua and going to be moderated by Dr. Alpana and Dr. Arpita from U Team UCA MS. And we have an and so I once again take this opportunity to thank everyone and a cooperation to team AOGD MC over the last one year. And we do look forward to participating in this activity for the next year also. Thank you so much. Please thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Asmita. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Lina Madhwa. She is an expert and the chairperson of today's meeting. Uh, may I, ha I have our uh, yeah. So Dr. Lina Vadva is professor in charge of reproductive medicine and surgery in ESI PGI MSR, Sai Darapur, Delhi. She is, uh, has got a fellowship in field of endoscopy and uh, she had the reproductive overseas scholarship for reproductive medicine and endoscopy in Germany, training in embryology from Chennai. And she has also been given uh, a company of oxy oration or maternal mortality. And uh, she's uh, got many publications in national, international journals, and she single-handedly, you know, developed this infertility program in her hospital in ESI, and which is now quite uh, successful. 
So, and the, today's uh, moderator for the today's class is Dr. Alpna Singh from UCMS and DTP Hospital. She is professor there with, and tre she was treasurer of AOGD in 2016 and 17, web editor of NARCHI, joint treasurer of AOGD in 11, 12 also, and the nodal officer of One Stop Center, honors in five subjects in MBBS, more than 50 publication and she's been editor of Placenta, basic to Akrita, recipient of many awards and paper presentations are there, especially interested in PCOS and done a lot of work in infertility. The other moderator for today's uh, class is Dr. Arpita Day. She is diploma in urogynecology and she's associate professor in HIMSA, in Hamdard Institute of Medical Sciences and Research specialized in vaginal surgeries and urogynecology and reviewer of many journals, including Jogi. Uh, she's also got many publications and winner of silver medal in AOGD paper 2017. Over to you, Arpita and Alpana, to start today's class with Preeti and Mawadas of GTB Hospital. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind introduction. And uh, I would like to say thanks to you and Dr. Shivani for giving us opportunity to uh, moderate such an important topic. And it is a great learning for the PG students and they are also developing habit of the case discussion and how to give the answers in the exams. So it is very important for them. And today we are discussing about the infertility. It is a, one of the gynecological disorder, but it is a needs a different type of the approach because here we are dealing with the couples. And they are already too, facing too much social uh, pressure and the stressed out. So they need a special attention for and careful listening about themselves. So by the case discussion, we will dis uh, detail uh, discuss how to take the history examination and how to approach such type of the cases. So without further delay, I would like to say my PGs to start the case presentation. Dr. Preeti Thakur will present the history part and the Mahua will be present the examination part of the uh, case. So I think Dr. Arpita, we should start the case discussion. Yes, we can start. So without any delay, Priti should start the uh, presentation of the case. I'm presenting case of Mrs. X, a 29 year old homemaker, educated till higher secondary, resident of Delhi, and presented to gynecology of GTB hospital with complaints of inability to conceive since last three years and irregular menstrual cycles since last four years. Uh, we can't see your uh, slides, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slides are visible, ma'am. Okay, yeah, yeah. So my view was the huh? option was different. Okay. Yeah, Fine. no, it's all right. Mm -hmm. You have to make it slideshow, that's it. Should I start now? Yeah, please start. I'm presenting case of Mrs. X, a 29-year-old homemaker, educated till higher secondary, a resident of Delhi, presented to gynae OPD of GTP Hospital with complaints of inability to conceive since three years and irregular menstrual cycles since last four years. Mrs. X, a 29-year-old homemaker, educated till higher secondary, resident of Delhi, presented to gynae OPD of GTP Hospital with complaints of inability to conceive since three years and irregular menstrual cycles since four years. History of presenting illness. Couple presented to gynae OPD with complaints of inability to conceive despite regular unprotected sexual intercourse with a married life of three years. It is a non consanguineous marriage and the couple is seeking medical attention for this problem for the first time. Coital frequency is adequate, that is three to four times per week. Uh, couple is not aware of fertile period and the uh, female is having history of irregular cycle so, since last four years with cycle length of 40 to 50 days, duration of flow lasting four to six days, soaking around three packs per day and there is no passage of clots. Previous cycles were normal, lasting three to four days in a cycle length of 28 to 32 days with normal flow. There is no history of uh, excessive facial hair or acne or weight gain, no history of milk secretion or discharge from breast, no history of neck swelling, weight gain or loss or heat uh, or cold intolerance. Uh, there is no history of palpitations or tremor, no history of hot flushes, mood disorder, no history of evening rise of temperature, chronic cough, loss of weight or appetite, uh, no history of pain over abdomen, any vaginal discharge, itching, lesions over vulval region or sexual promiscuity in the couple. There is no history of any instrumentation or intervention done for vaginally. So, uh, Preeti, one thing, can you just enumerate what all things you want to rule out with your history? Yes, ma'am. 
Ma'am, uh, while ruling out excessive facial hair, acne and weight gain, I want to rule out uh, polymorphic uh, uh, PCOS, ma'am, mainly. Uh, no, so there's a long list of the negative history you have taken here. So this much is required. Why have you taken so much exhaustive yes, list of the negative history? You can elaborate each one and tell whatever differentials you have in mind. Yes, ma'am. Uh, by ruling out milk secretion and discharge from breast, uh, we are ruling out uh, hyperprolactinemia, which can be a cause of uh, amino uh, aminoria or oligomenoria. Uh, by ruling out neck swelling, weight gain or loss, heat or cold intolerance, uh, palpitations and tremor, we are ruling out hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Constipation and bowel movements you can add. Yes, ma'am, you can also add that. And uh, by, uh, by taking negative history of hot flushes and mood disorder, we are ruling out premature ovarian insufficiency uh, or early menopause. Uh, uh, by taking history of evening rise of temperature, chronic cough, loss of weight or appetite, we are ruling out uh, genital TB or uh, TB. Uh, no history of, uh, by taking history of pain lower abdomen or any vaginal discharge, itching lesions, sexual promiscuity, we are ruling out any STI or PID in the couple. And uh, by ruling out any instrumentation or intervention for vaginally, we are trying to rule out Eshelman syndrome. So here, uh, the sexual promiscuity, you can, I think, club with the uh, sexual history. Right, because I think your sexual history is over three parts. This can be in one part. You have mentioned it in the first slide, second, as well as the third one. You can club it in one. Next slide, you can go to the next slide. Uh, Ma'am, by ruling out trauma to head, blurring of vision, and also headache and eating disorders, uh, we are ruling out any uh, hypothalamic pituitary cause. Okay. And by ruling out dyspareunia or chronic pain abdomen, we are ruling out endometriosis. Uh, by taking history of sexual dysfunction, uh, ma'am, this is uh, normal. Uh, if there is no history of sexual dysfunction or decrease the deep vaginosis or usage of lubricants, it can lead to infertility. And uh, so here you can combine everything, including your uh, the part of dyspareunia, the frequency, uh, this you have attached, and the previous one. So you, this can be under one heading of the sexual because this becomes an important part from terms of infertility. Okay, ma'am. Continue. By taking history of contraceptive usage, we are uh, trying to rule out any injectable uh, injectable uh, contraceptive like the uh, DMPA, uh, report metoxy progesterone acetate, which can cause irregular cycles. And uh, again, by so why only contraceptives? Why not all drugs? Any drugs? Drugs have different repercussions. So first of all, uh, contraception apart from injectable, do you have anything else in mind? Ma'am, uh, in terms of drugs. Yes, drugs. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, drugs can cause irregular cycles like metoclopramide, antidepressants, uh, antidepressants antipsychotics. Uh, then we have uh, androgens. Basically, those are causing prolactin disorders, number one. Yes, and if it's oral contraceptives per se, because it will uh, delay the cycles. Anything else? OCP is also because, or any type of contraception, because the she will uh, regain her fecund, uh, fecundability. No? Okay. The duration of uh, regain of the fecundability is different for the OCPs, for the injectable contraceptive, for the Saheli. So you okay. have to consider that also. That period will not come into the period of infertility. Okay. okay. Just go ahead with the history. Yeah. Uh, slide back again. Anything? Uh, and what about, uh, suppose this patient has, um, you know, infertility and later on in the examination, you have findings of hirsutism, then do you think contraception per se has any role in that, both in terms of, can you elaborate on that? So contraception, that is there. Any role in terms of if you think of hirsutism, suppose in the examination you get hirsutism. Okay, ma'am. Then why is the type of contraception important? You get it? Uh, ma'am, uh, for hirsutism, uh, for contraception, if uh, we are given. So basically, contraceptives may include any type of progesterone. It can either indicate that she had treatment or even the generation of progesterone, there can be progesterones which are having 
mineralocorticoid or glucocorticoid or androgenic properties, which can lead to hirsutism. That is why the type of contraceptive becomes important. Preeti, go ahead with the history. Okay, mention history. Then speak loudly, Preeti. Okay. The patient had Minati at 13 years of age. Her last menstrual period was on 27 Feb 23. Uh, previous cycles were regular as described before, and current cycles are four to six days uh, in a cycle length of 40 to 50 days. So, for three packs per day. Treatment history there is no history of any previous treatment for infertility or any chronic medication intake. What do you understand by delayed periods? Is there any way we can define it? Yes, ma'am. Uh, post Minaki, uh, post Minaki, we have uh, three categories. I can say that uh, for the first year post Minaki, if the cycle is more than ninety days, mm -hmm. if the cycle length is more than ninety days, then you will say that it is a prolonged cycle. Uh, for one to three years post Minaki, it is more than forty-five days or less than twenty-one days to call it uh, menstrual irregularity. And for uh, and after three years, it is more than thirty-five days or less than twenty-one days. And what if the patient has secondary amenorrhea, then how will you define secondary amenorrhea? Uh, Ma'am, uh, secondary amenorrhea, if the patient has uh, regular cycles, then uh, if she has amenorrhea for three months, uh, that is 90 days, or uh, uh, for irregular cycles for six months, then we'll call it as irregular cycles. Uh, nine cycles in a year. Secondary amenorrhea. Continue. Menstrual history, uh, I have said, then treatment history. No history of any uh, previous treatment for infertility. No history of any chronic medication intake. Personal history, uh, the patient is vegetarian by diet and has normal bladder and bowel habit. She has normal appetite and sleep pattern. She is non-alcoholic, non-smoker. There is no history of substance abuse and no history of any non-drug allergy. No history of any contraceptive method uh, usage. Past history, uh, there is no history of TB or TB contact, thyroid disorder, diabetes, or hypertension. No past history of any significant medical or surgical illness. So why is it so important to take, uh, specifically in this case, when we are talking about diabetes, hypertension, why is it so important in infertility? Uh, Ma'am, diabetes can lead to insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. In diabetes, we see insulin resistance, which, which can lead to uh, stimulation of LH receptors more than required and uh, it also leads to overproduction of androgen from uh, ovarian stroma. That's why uh, it causes uh, uh, the follicular genesis is impaired and we get poor follicles. Okay. Poor follicular genesis and uh, it will lead to infertility. Hypertension, uh, hypertension we have anti-hypertensive drugs which can cause impaired uh, impaired what is hypertension per se? So when we are talking about irregular cycles, we are talking about blood sugar, we are talking about hypertension. Yes, ma'am. Are we thinking of something? Ma'am, uh, some drugs. Not drugs. Anti-hypertensive drugs. Hypertension like per se. How it yes, affects the fertility? Hypertension. Uh... It is a systemic disorder. Yes, ma'am. Of course, any systemic disorder can cause uh, uh, inflammation. And, and what about these together? Okay, suppose the patient has come with PCO, she is giving history, she's diabetic, she's hypertensive. Does it include, does it mean that she's having an additional disorder which has more ramifications? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Metabolic syndrome. Uh, we metabolic can think of syndrome. metabolic syndrome. Yes, ma'am. Metabolic syndrome. So, what is the part which is missing? You have diabetes, hypertension. Yes, ma'am. What uh, components uh, are there in metabolic syndrome? In metabolic syndrome, we have five criteria. First is uh, waist circumference. If the waist circumference is more than 88 centimeters for the female, uh, then we have impaired glucose tolerance, uh, which uh, we can take in form of fasting blood sugar between 100, 100 to 126 mg per dl and postprandial between 140 to 199 mg per dl. Uh, then we have uh, serum dyslipidemia, in which we have triglyceride level more than 150 and HDL level less than 50. And uh, we have uh, PP 130.85, more than 130.85. And uh, okay. so basically that is the idea that once you come to know about metabolic, so if you have two components, maybe you, you will look out for hyperlipidemia and that will influence your counseling as well as the treatment part, correct? Yes, so go ahead with the history. We can come back to it later. Okay, ma'am. Family history. There is no history of diabetes, hypertension, or TB in family. No history of any mental retardation or genetic risk for disorders. Or no history of premature menopause, menstrual irregularities in the mother or sister. 
husband history uh, the husband is 32 years old a grocery shopkeeper educated till higher secondary uh, he is a non smoker non alcoholic non alcoholic with no history of substance abuse or excessive caffeine consumption no history of erectile dysfunction or uh, premature or retrograde ejaculation decreased libido uh, no history of mumps in childhood tb or sti no history of testicular trauma or swelling over genital organs no history of any chronic illness like diabetes or hypertension and no history of any surgical intervention it is uh, so easy to take the history of the erectile dysfunction from the male partner like you have said here premature ejaculation retrograde ejaculation so how how do you take such type of the history ma'am in premature ejaculation uh, the uh, before reaching the before reaching the state of orgasm uh, the male will ejaculate or there is early ejaculation so And usually such type the history you don't ask to the male partner first you yes, have to discuss all the, about the sexual history with the female part with uh, yes sir saying something part. abnormal in the erection problem or any type of the problem erectile dysfunction then you have to discuss in the couple do the counseling talk about them then yes, they sir. have to come out with their symptoms it is very difficult to tell them in the first instance similar. about their sexual history and not they can too straight forward to give such type of the history Yes, so sir. you have to just first take the history from the female partner and if you are suspecting yes there is a problem in the male so then after that you have to do the counseling and discussion with the couple and in front of the female if she he is comfortable then take otherwise in the alone also you can take such a the history okay thank you so go ahead with that uh why is mumps important mumps mom uh, mumps uh, destroys uh, sertoli's uh, mumps destroys uh, seminiferous tubules yes so there is sertoli only sertoli cell only syndrome that we get with mumps okay so not the mumps but tb is a very classically written in the books mumps or cartilage lead to the aegospermia or the severe oligospermia and we are all uh, always uh, not focusing much on the tb but tb is also very TB big chunk, also very, very big chunk so leading to the oligospermia or the severe oligospermia and even the sexually transmitted infections are also very common because of the poor socio economic status in our patients so don't neglect such type of the history just don't focus but many time the childhood mumps patient don't remember also yes ma'am fine what about uh, swelling of a genital organs what are we thinking of Ma'am, uh, uh, I I was thinking of varicocele right. oh, or hydrocele. Right. And surgical intervention. Ma'am, uh, any surgery or any surgery uh, like uh, for crypto orchidism or uh, for any penile surgery. Penile surgeries as well because surgery. not even that any retro peritoneal surgery yes, also any retro peritoneal denervation. Mm. that can lead to the ejaculatory dysfunctions in the male also so any type of the abdominal surgery in especially in the pelvic area okay leading to the uh, problem in the vas deferens also so uh, obstruction in the vas deferens can there is no history of multiple sexual partners the uh, husband is a vegetarian by diet with normal bladder and bowel habit normal appetite and sleep pattern and there is no family history of di uh, diabetes hypertension or genetic disorder which type of genetic disorder do you are suspecting in the male uh, ma'am uh, i am thinking of klein filter syndrome or uh, we can have kolman's uh, microdeletion of y Microdeletion of Y, and then um, Young syndrome. Any other syndrome? syndrome. Yes, ma'am. Young syndrome, immotile cilia syndrome. Then we have Carter Jenner syndrome. So, how much is the how com common is the Klinefelter syndrome? Ma'am, it is one in one thousand. Uh, its incidence is one in one thousand. So, it and, is quite common. Cool. Could you tell us what is the peculiar feature of such type of the male of Klinefelter syndrome? Yes, ma'am. The male will be tall, uh, with the features of hypoandrogenism. Hypoandrogenism, uh, like, like uh, there will be no beard, beard or mustache won't be there. There will be gynecomasia. No, not no, but maybe the under viralized. The man will be under viralized with the gynecomasia and anything. Ma'am, testes will be very uh, small and firm testes. Okay. And the uh, male with the Carter Jenner syndrome, how will manifest? What will be the symptoms? 
मैम इन कार्डाजीनर सिंड्रोम इट इज बेसिकली सीलियर डिफेक्ट सो देर विल बी सीलियर प्रॉब्लम लाइक देर कैन बी ब्रॉन्टिस इनवर्सेस एंड देन साइनोसाइटिस then so recurrent respiratory tract infection will be the first manifestation yes, in such yeah. type of the males yes, okay. so mahua go ahead with the examination of female partner yes ma'am uh, the patient is conscious cooperative well oriented to time place and person she is well built and well nourished her height is 155 cm and weight is 69 kg make him bmi of 27 kg per meter square her waist to hip ratio is 0.84 क्लासीफाई बी एम आई Yes, ma'am. Uh, there are two classification according to the uh, Asian BMI and WHO BMI. There are two different classification Correct. according to the Asian BMI. My patient is uh, comes under the uh, obese category one, uh, which is uh, more which is more than twenty five to twenty nine point nine. And according oh, to the WHO BMI, hmm. she will be she will come under the uh, overweight category. Correct. Which one should we be using? This is Asia Pacific guidelines. Ma'am, uh, ma'am, in our country we should use the Asian category. Asia Pacific guidelines. So come back to your slide. Uh, the examination one. You have commented on waist hip ratio. Does it tell us anything? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the waist hip ratio is also uh higher in my patient. Hmm. Uh, ma'am, because uh it it indicates moderate risk of diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. So uh, what type of um, overweight or obesity is indicated with higher waist hip ratio? Ma'am, central obesity is indicative of. So that is more in androgenic type of obesity. Androgenic. All right. So that. So what else? Diagnosis. Ma'am, how do you measure the waist and hip ratio? Uh, ma'am, the waist. Uh, we should know how to measure it. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, the waist uh, uh circumference is the mid a uh, mid point between the lower margin of the last palpable rib, mm. the top of the iliac crest. The hip circumference is taken around the widest portion of the buttocks. So we okay, take the waist to hip ratio from that. Yeah, for Indians also it is different. You mentioned more than eighty-eight centimeter. That is for Western, but for Indian, it is more than eighty centimeter. Eighty-two, ma'am. More for India, it is more than eighty-two. Yes. Carry on. Okay. Uh, there was no pallor, ictus, sinusitis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, pedal edema, no uh, sign of hirsutism, abnormal hair pattern, alopecia. There was no sign of virilization. No acanthosis nigricans. Her bilateral breast was soft. No signs of galactoria. Thyroid was normal. CNS, CVS, and respiratory system was. Uh, so, Mahua, one uh, question here. What all sites do you see for scoring hirsutism? Yes, ma'am. Talking ma about Perryman Galway. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, there are nine sites uh, for uh, seeing the uh, uh, seeing the modified Perryman Galway scoring. There are nine sites, which is ma'am uh, upper lip, uh, chin, then uh, upper chest, uh, upper abdomen, lower abdomen, upper back, uh, lower back, and inner thigh and upper uh, arm. So ma'am, the scoring is from zero to four. The maximum is thirty six, and uh, and ma'am. Uh, Basically, it is a score till four. So nine into four becomes thirty-six. That is how you get thirty-six. Hmm. Then further, how do you classify as mild, moderate, and severe hirsutism? Normal is below eight. A uh, mild is eight to eight to fifteen. Eight to eleven. Sorry. A uh, mild is eight to eleven. A uh, moderate is eleven to uh, a fort. Uh, no, no, eleven to twenty-one. And uh, severe is more than. Uh, Okay, so what is the importance of the severity? Ma'am, it will tell about the hypo uh, hyperandrogenism, uh, hyperandrogenism in the uh, patient. So, and is there a term which is uh, 
what is the difference between hyperandrogenism and virilization? So this is not important in this patient, but any patient with hirsutism, you have to take a certain history for classifying as virilization. That is what you're trying to tell me, right? Yes, ma'am. Moderate to severe? Maybe associated with virilization. So how is virilization different from hyperandrogenism uh, or the features of PCO? Ma'am, uh, virilization, uh, in virilization, the patient will also have a uh, male, uh, male type of voice and male pattern distribution of hair. With, uh, and with, along with that, uh, there will be clitoromegaly also present. In the hysterism, there will be no signs of that. One more thing, one more thing. Think I mean, ma'am, bi biochemically, ma'am, okay. testosterone levels will be no, more than... biochemically. Clinically, the patient will have breast atrophy. Mm -hmm. There will be marked breast atrophy along with changes, change in voice and the other uh, factors that you said. So coming back to... Uh, can you go back to one slide back? Huh. So uh, we talked about this. Now tell me, suppose the patient comes with increased hair on the arms... Will that be an uh, uh, androgenic feature that is not there in the Ferryman Galway, right? So is there any term for that? It's very common to have girls coming. So we know chin, breast, lower abdomen, that all goes with PCO, hirsutism, but whatever. So is there any term or is there any difference between the term and... Uh, Ma'am, uh, in uh, hirsutism... Uh, there will be terminal hair growth Correct. will be there. Correct. And uh, normally uh, there will be, it will be coarse hair. Fine. That is the pattern of the hair, no? Pattern. But if that right. 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 not in the, your Fairman Galway score area, then what is the entity called as? Mummy, uh, the upper arm is included. So okay. hypertrichosis is the term. So that can be as a part, that's a milder thing. Usually it can be a part of uh, a drug side effect. And what about acanthosis nigrans? You're talking about acanthosis nigrans. How does, uh, how do you define, how do you uh, uh, see whether she has acanthosis? Ma'am, it is a uh, velvety, velvety uh, hyperpigmented region. Uh, right, right. which is found in the insulin resistance right, and right, it is right, found. commonly in the nape of the neck and uh, under, underarm and the right. breast lower, lower margin of the breast so how does uh, so is there any syndrome uh, yes ma'am hair and syndrome is hair and syndrome uh, ma'am it is a hyperandrogenism insulin resistance and acanthosis nigricon syndrome right. so uh, management wise is it very different from uh, PCO. Uh, we'll come to the management later. Chalo, aage chalo. Yeah, yeah. We have to discuss too many things because ah. we are dealing, we have to deal with the male also. So we have to can't yes, afford yes. so much time. Na? Okay. For the one entity. Go ahead with examination. Uh, ma'am, on per abdomen examination. Mama, go ahead with examination. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on per abdomen examination, obesity was present. Umbilicus was central, inverted. With no surgical scar marks, no engorged veins or sinuses, hernia sites were free, all four quadrants are soft, non-tender, and there's no palpable mass or organomegaly. On local examination, external genitalia was well developed with normal labia majora and minora with normal hair distribution, and there was no clitoromegaly. On per speculum examination, cervix was mid-position, nulliparous, healthy. Vagina was healthy with no discharge. On per vagina examination, cervix was mid position, firm, no cervical motion tenderness. Uterus was uh, antiverted, normal size, firm, mobile, and non tender. Bilateral phonesis were free, no antelixal mass or tenderness was present, and no nodularity or tenderness in the pouch of Douglas. Do you think PV examination is mandatory in all infertility female patients? No, ma'am. Uh, PV examination is not mandatory. Uh, in the recent guidelines, uh, it is only done if any there is uh, history suggestion of PID or endometriosis. No, if you are suspecting any pathology and Patho you are uh, thinking tactile uh, sensation, tactile examination will be change Tenor. in your management. But provided you have a good ultrasound facility, otherwise. But this is the PG forum guidelines says there should be the no PG exam, PV examination 
it should be the uh, enough to do the ultrasound but i say uh, one pv examination and the ps examination is must because maybe the small polyp it cannot be seen in the ultrasound it cannot be so the tactile uh, examination gives the too much information so guidelines whatever saying but for the pgs i think ps and pv examination should be done at a at least once in the uh, work up of yes, the infertile. I agree with Dr. Alpana and if you suspect most common in Indian setting we see PID is very common and uh, yes. simultaneously pap smear and discharge examination if required should be done. Yeah. So we should not just go by the western guidelines. This is the standard practice of teaching. So what is your probable diagnosis Mahua, for this case? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the probable diagnosis will be 29 year old Nali Gravida married for three years with primary infertility, most likely ovulatory factor with obesity category one. Okay, so what are your differential for this case? Uh, ma'am, uh, the differential would be ma'am, stress induced, obesity induced, hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, PCOS, premature ovarian insufficiency and uh, late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But your patient is not having any features of the blurring of vision, galactoria, and examination. So why have you kept hyperprolactinemia here in the differentials? Uh, Ma'am, uh, because uh, more than 75% of cases of hyperprolactinemia doesn't have galactoria as the present uh, feature. And also, ma'am, headache, blurring of vision will only occur when the serum prolactin level will be more than 100 or any microadenoma or macroadenoma is present. So ma'am, uh, below... 100 uh, serum prolactin level, uh, they present uh, with oligo or amenorrhea, which will lead to uh, infertility. So this patient is having this problem since three years. So significant anovulatory problem she is having. So it is justified. And Preeti, can you tell us why premature ovarian substance in the differential? Yes, ma'am. Uh, as we can see that our patient has irregular cycles since last uh, four, four years. years. Since last four years. And uh, by Ashut guidelines, we have a uh, we have our criteria of premature ovarian insufficiency as irregular cycles for uh, four months or more. So we can uh, also the prevalence, as we can see, uh, that prevalence at age 30 is around 1 in 1,000. So it can also be a cause for uh, infertility. And uh, we'll like to keep this thing also in our mind. And we'll go with serum access levels also. If the serum access level is more than 25 international units per liter on more than uh, on two occasions, more than four weeks apart, then we can say that it is due to premature ovarian. So, what is the best test to uh, uh, detect the premature ovarian insufficiency? Uh, Ma'am, to detect premature ovarian insufficiency, uh, the diagnostic test is FFH only, but to uh, see the decreased ovarian reserves, we can uh, do serum image levels. It is considered as the best test. And vice versa, yeah, equivalent to the FC also. Uh, if AFC, you are good or expert in the ultrasound, then FC, by seeing the FC, you can say. So how, how many uh, follicles enter follicle to say that the normal and the abnormal or the decrease of ovarian reserve? So how many should be? Uh, Ma'am, if the follicle count is less than 4, then it is suggestive of poor ovarian reserve. If it is between 10 to 13, then it is a good ovarian reserve. Uh, okay. 10 to 14 or 10 to 13. And... Uh, uh, for AMH levels, ma'am, 1 to 3.5 uh, nanogram per ml is considered as the normal range. And below 1, below one, uh, the most of the guidelines say 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.7 nanogram per ml is associated with poor ovarian reserve. And if it is more than 4, then it is suggestive of PCU. It can be due to PCU. So how do you further confirm your diagnosis, Preeti? Uh, ma'am, for further confirmation uh, of our diagnosis, I would like to proceed with investigations, uh, which can be, uh, which will be baseline investigations and targeted investigations. Uh, among baseline investigation, I would like to go with complete blood count, uh, viral markers for both partners, and 75 gram OGTT test, uh, and then pap smear also, and urine routine examination also. Uh, in the targeted investigation uh, for male, I would like to go with husband semen analysis. And for female, I would like to have a thyroid function test, serum prolactin, serum free testosterone, uh, 17 hydroxyprogesterone, transvaginal scan uh, to see the uterus at next uh, enteral follicle count and PCO morphology. And also, I would like to evaluate the tubes using hysterosalpingography. In your battery of tests, there is a uh, you have not mentioned about the endometrial biopsy. Why? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, actually, endometrial biopsy. Uh, earlier, it was used to uh, see whether the endometrium, whether the cycles are ovulatory or not, and whether the endometrium is secretory or uh, uh, 
security or proliferative whether what all what is the phase but uh, now it is it does not help us in uh, seeing the uh, well but the, uh, the cause of fertility cannot be diagnosed based on endometrial biopsy. So we can do it endometrial biopsy, but to rule out TB. At, in current scenario, uh, to see the endometrial uh, endometrial stage, endometrial staging uh, of cycle, endometrial so cycle. How, how common are the genital TB in India? Ma'am, it is uh, almost, it is responsible to 10 to 15% of uh, uh, female infertility. So do you want, uh, do, you don't want to investigate for the TB in your patient? She's having infertility for three years. Ma'am, she is having infertility, but there are no symptoms. I, I have ruled out any history suggestive of uh, TB. So I won't like to go endometrial biopsy. And there's a clear cut uh, anovulatory factor in your patient. Yes, And she's obese also. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So it is so anything else you want to see in the basic ultrasound? You want to see the FC, PCO morphology, any other thing? Ma'am, I would like to see the endometrial mm -hmm. uterus. Uh... Ma'am, in transvaginal ultrasound, we can see for any uterine pathology, like mm -hmm. uh, sub, -muco sub mucosal fibroid or polyp. Or, uh, fibroid adenomyosis. No. Okay. Yeah, tell me on day two uh, of the cycle when you're doing ultrasound, what is important uh, in the case of infertile women and what all things you would like to see? Ma'am, in an uh, infertile women on day two of ultrasound, we'll do the enteral follicle count. And uh, I would also like to see the endometrial thickness. How much should be the endometrial thickness when you're doing ultrasound on day two, day three? Ma'am, it would be around 3 mm. Three, two, yeah, it should be less than five millimeter. That is very important. And one thing is usually in an infertile woman, uh, we do one cycle of natural cycle monitoring to see yes, if the endometrium is growing well and the follicle is forming or whether it is unovulatory. So that is also an important part. And when you're talking about the baseline investigations, what I could see is that lipid profile is missing because you're suspecting this uh, as a PCOS. So at least baseline lipid profile to rule out metabolic syndrome and further uh, monitoring monitoring if required okay, one more question so once we are talking about pc usually associated with larger ovarian volumes but what if on day two i see that the ovarian volume is less uh, what, is the talk on what does it if, tell us if the ovarian volume is less than 3 ml then it can be it can yes. be suggestive of poor ovarian reserves less okay. than 3 ml so this is the investigation report of your uh, couple. This is the report of husband semen analysis. And it is, uh, semen volume is 1.6 ml, count is 10 million per ml, and per ejaculate 35 million. Total motility is 34% and progressive motility is 28%. Viability is 60% and morphology 4%, more than 4% is the normal. So this is the report. Mahwa, do you want to comment on this report? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in this report, ma we can see the sperm count is less because the normal uh, WH 2021, uh, the sperm count is 16 million per ml. And also the uh, total motility is less in this patient, which is which should be more than 42%. So ma'am, this patient has uh, oligo spermia. So what could be cause of the oligo spermia in this patient? Uh, what do you think? Can be, um, there can be decreased uh, semi-vestibular function, hypogonadism can be the cause, or, or any uh, endocrine. Or uh, obesity induced can occur, or... Um, or any infection also in any inf any sort of infection is maybe the partial obstruction of the ejaculatory ducts hmm. might be okay and uh, simultaneously he is having the acinojuspermia also so what could be cause of this acinojuspermia well acinojuspermia uh, it uh, it can be also genetic in the like in the cartogenic syndrome. There there are more volume uh, more volume of non viable sperms, so there are also that total motility is decreased and also my due to infection or auto antibodies. So anti sperm antibodies. Yes. And the problem in the epididymis also leading to the.
problem in the mortality. Okay. So, Preeti, this is the report of the female part. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, you can see all the things, whatever you have uh, advised, the, uh, only the ultrasound is abnormal and all other things are normal. HSG is also normal here. So, TBA suggests you of the PCO morphology. So, what is the diagnosis for this uh, female? The diagnosis for this female would be uh, non hyperandrogenic PCOS. Uh, so we can see that the, the rotor has criteria. Two of the criteria are met with ovulated dysfunction as well as PCO morphology. So we can keep our female patient in the definition of. Uh, so, what is the PCO phenotype of, uh, in this patient? Type D, uh, that is non hyperandrogenic COS, uh, in which we have ovulated dysfunction and PCO morphology, and uh, its prevalence is. 17.5%. So do you think it is a good type, the PCO uh, phenotype or the bad type for the infertility per se? Ma'am, for infertility per se, mm -hmm. uh, it is a good type uh, because by using ovulation induction, uh, fertility can be easily achieved in these patients. Because they don't have a hyperandrogenic. Hyperandrogenic. They are easily ovulated by the medication, whatever you will give. Yeah, just to add on, Mm -hmm. uh, because nowadays the recent concept what is coming up in PCOS is uh, not the uh, what is more important than these phenotypes is to see whether the woman is obese <coughs> or she is a lean PCOS. <laughs> like although this particular patient fits into the D type phenotype, but mm -hmm. uh, she has the characteristics of obesity. Yeah. So yes, obesity per se is a risk factor. So not only we'll say that D phenotype, it is not only the D phenotype, it is also Obese the type. obesity that is Obese that type. also has an impact. That is also. Yes, ma'am. So Mawa, uh, as the semen analysis is suggestive for ligoestinol juice permia. So how would you further proceed to manage the male factor? Ma'am, first I would like to do uh, examination of the male partner along with some uh, a test. The first one uh, examination of this male partner was done, which came up to be uh, height was 180 centimeter, weight was 84 kg, BMI mm -hmm. was 25.9 kg per meter square. BMI first it was normal, thyroid was normal, there was no gynecomastia. So on local examination, penis was normal, external urethral meters was normally positioned, scrotum was normal in appearance. Violated test size and consistency was normal, and there was no evidence of varicocele. So, do you think this examination, uh, as we have done in our clinic, it should be done by the gynecologist or not? Uh, Ma'am, uh, it can be done by a gynecologist, but mostly we uh, first we do husband semen analysis. If it comes abnormal, we should do examination, or we can also refer to urologist for that. So, this is the big hesitation of the gynecologist. But yes, it is written in the book everywhere. But you should have a, some experience to examine the male partner. Then definitely you can do the examination of the male partner as the female partner. And it is a better for the uh, rapport building with the couple also. If you're doing the, it's a convenient for the patient also. So like in our clinic, we do the first examination. If something we find abnormal or not confident to manage or something we want the further opinion, then we refer the patient to the andrologist. Okay. So you have found just the, he is the obese. Fine. And everything is uh, normal. So what next do you want to do in this patient? Ma'am, I would like to repeat the husband's semen analysis, uh, which is done uh, one month apart to confirm my diagnosis. Uh, and in this case, uh, it again came up to be your ligoestinosospermia. No. Why one month apart? Uh, Ma'am. And in be between the one month, what are you doing with this male part? You have just left him alone or doing something or telling something or doing counseling with him. What are you doing? Uh, Ma'am, uh, it, it is done one, um, one month apart because um, in some cases, it, uh, they, uh, they have uh, less uh, duration of abstinence, which is normally three to five days. But they, sometimes the patient will uh, give the sample without any abstinence or maybe faulty in the collection uh, sample. So it is, has to be done twice for uh, confirmation of the diagnosis. And ma'am, in this one month duration, I would like to advise him lifestyle modification. If he's obese, I would like to uh, advise him to uh, reduction of weight and uh, wear loose undergarments. And uh, if he's addict addicted to alcohol or smoking or caffeine, I would like, to, uh, like him to advise to uh, reduce the amount. 
and to repeat the uh, so, uh, healthy lifestyle practices he yes, should do between uh, the this one month so if there is a, some temporary problem with the lifestyle then it will be the correct by that so after the one month the simon report is almost similar to the previous one so what is the final diagnosis preeti for this couple because we have repeated the semen sample we have done the investigation of the female also yes ma'am uh, ma'am my final diagnosis would be 29 year old nandi ramya married for 3 years with primary infertility uh, and uh, with pcos with male infertility that is combined fine so ovulatory dysfunction is very common 30 to 40% fine and the male factor is also around 20% and if we see the combined factor then they will in the indian prevalence is around 50% so this couple has a 50% problem in the conception yes. okay so mawa can you tell us what are what are the causes of male infertility yes ma'am uh, ma'am uh, causes of male infertility are divided into three groups pretesticular testicular and posttesticular among which testicular accounts for 50% of the cases in pretesticular ma'am uh, we have endocrine causes like gonadotropin deficiency obesity induced thyroid dysfunction or hyperprolactinemia there can be uh, psychosexual uh, dysfunction like erectile dysfunction or impotence the drugs which which suppresses pituitary or uh erectile dysfunction like antihypertensives or antipsychotics or genetics cause like uh, klinefelter syndromes or y chromosome deletions so ma'am in testicular causes uh, we have cryptorchidism cartagena syndrome infections like mumps or cystitis and toxins also like uh, chemo radiation smoking then ma'am in the uh, varicocele is there in certain uh, cell only syndrome can cause and primary testicular failure in the the post testicular comprises of the obstruction to the uh, obstruction of the efferent duct which can be congenital and acquired in congenital we have um, cystic fibrosis congenital absence of vas deferens and in young syndrome and in acquired infection induced like tb gonorrhea or surgical uh, surgical induced like uh, surgery surgery done for vasectomy or hernerophy yeah. the test you advise in this patient is the case of uh, oligosynospermia yes ma'am ma'am since my patient have oligosynospermia i would like to do some endocrine test uh mm -hmm. like a tsh and prolactin levels since my patient is obese so i'd also like to do blood blood sugar fasting and postprandial and i'd also like to do serum testosterone if the serum testosterone is abnormal then i can uh, further do uh, serum fhs and lh and also a, a transcranial ultrasound to confirm my physical findings and also to detect the non palpable varicocele okay so the the reports of all the things th thyroid prolactin sugars and ultrasound is the normal so what could be the final diagnosis for this male uh ma'am the final diagnosis would be then idiopathic oligosynospermia for this patient so most likely the maybe the environmental factors lifestyle factors or there is some level of the spermatogenesis problem so most likely the testicular cause so could you just tell in the brief about the drugs causing the problem in the uh, impair in the fertility in the male yes, because very commonly the drugs are getting used by the males nowadays yes ma'am the drugs uh, which uh, impaired the spermatogenesis can uh, are by uh, nitrofurantoin which is the more commonly used antibiotic doxycycline then methotrexate or any chemotherapy used and the drugs which uh, causes pituitary suppression is one of the most important is anabolic steroids yes, which are used by the, the bodybuilders the males who are going in the gym is a very fashion the drugs yes. they are taking the anabolic steroids and they are building the muscles but they are the simultaneously developing the infertility so and many times they don't know they are taking some protein supplements and also take the history very carefully the history of any type of the supplements if they are taking okay and other than that the common is the anti hypertensive and anti depressant also fine yes so your patient is a case of oligosaccharide juice permia so priti how will you manage this couple Uh, ma'am, my plan of management will be uh, ovulation induction with intrauterine insemination. I have chosen ovulation induction because my patient is patient uh, patient uh, is having a uh, PCO PCOS and uh, PCOS induced uh, ovulation. I'm sorry, 
And also, ma'am, I would like to go with intrauterine insemination as the male is having uh, mild form. Mild form. Or I go as tenosostomy. So for the male, uh, you have decided the intrauterine insemination, and female is the ovulation induction. Okay. So how how will you proceed further for the management? You have made the plan for the OI plus yes, IY for this couple. Okay. So how will you proceed further? Ma'am, first of all, I would like to counsel the couple and. Uh, uh, as counseling is cornerstone of our management, the couple might be in stress, uh, stress, uh, and so their psychosexual counseling is also needed. And uh, I also need to develop a rapport with the patient so that so that they can share their problems clearly with me, and uh, uh, it would help us in further management of the patient. De-stressing is very important. Then lifestyle modification of couple is very important, in which I would advise uh, dietary as well as exercise modification. Uh, also yoga and other de uh, deep breathing exercises uh, I would like to advise to the patient and uh, uh, ma'am for male we can also advise antioxidants uh, which is under Mawa do you think the antioxidant will help in this male? Uh, ma'am uh, ma actually uh, according to the corporate review the, the yeah, antioxidants may lead to increased live birth rates and clinical pregnancy rates, but uh, there are limited uh, studies in this. So further studies are to be are required for uh, these things to be clinical uh, to come in practice, clinical practice. But ma'am, uh, we should give antioxidants uh, because they they might uh, help in uh, increased live pregnancy rate. Yes, Cochrane review said about that. In, there's enough number of the literature and the market is full with the type of them the combination of the antioxidant but the studies available they don't they are silent about the clinical pregnancy rate we want to see the replication of the supplementation in the form of the clinical pregnancy that's why the cochrane is unable to give the concluding remark about this or framing the guidelines but whatever the studies available we are doing the study we saw that by giving the antioxidant the quality of the semen parameters improve. So there's a no harm in giving the short-term antioxidant therapy to this male because it is a idiopathic and the, all the endocrinological parameters are normal. So we will we can give the three months therapy of antioxidant to this male partner also. So Preeti discuss about the ovulation protocols because this is the PG forum and that is a quite big chunk of the treatment of the infertility either in the form of IUIE or the IVF. So, uh, discuss the ovulation induction in your patient. Uh, now for ovulation inductions, we have various uh, agents uh, or drugs like promethine citrate, letrozole, uh, or gonadotropins. Uh, now currently, letrozole is the drug of choice for ovulation induction in PCMS. Uh, we can also use promethine citrate. Uh, now we have various protocols for these drugs. And uh, first of all, we have letrozole, uh, which is aromatase inhibitor. Uh, we started uh, on day, uh, we can start it from day three to day seven of the menstrual cycle uh, uh, with a dose of 2.5 mg per day, given uh, for five days. And uh, from day, 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 day eight or day nine onwards, we will start the folliculometry using uh, transvaginal scan. And once the follicle size is around 18 mm or 18 to 20 mm, we will uh, give the ovulation trigger in form of SCG or any other uh, agent. Use for Suppose is, uh, by this conventional uh, dose of the aromatase uh, letrozole, yes, there is no ovulation. Then what? Which protocol of letrozole do you use? Ma'am, we will use, we when we can give extended therapy in such cases. Uh, we'll give the rather than giving the letrozole for five days. Now we'll give it for day three to day ten. That is for almost uh, ten days for. Yes, ma'am. And uh, it is advantageous in uh, chromophin uh, citrate resistant PCOS cases, also letrozole resistant. PCOS cases. So, see, uh, clomiphene was a time-tested drug. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, now, the we are started moving from the clomiphene to the letrozole. So, what are the benefit of the uh, letrozole over the clomiphene? Do you think? Ma'am, first of all, clomiphene citrate has a longer half-life of around five days, while letrozole has a short half-life of 45 years. Uh, as it is rapidly eliminated, the side effects are less. Uh, the side effects on cervical mucus and endometrium are less. So, uh, we have better pregnancy rates with letrozole. Also, uh, the rate of uh, multifetal pregnancy is less and uh, there is uh, absence of antihistrogenic side effects, as I have said, and the need for uh, intensive monitoring is also less. 
uh, as there so is the is the promoting the monofollicular development good yes. for the endometrium and the cervical mucus friendly so that's why the and here is the case of pco so chances of ohs is very high so letrozole is prefer over the clomiphene yes ma'am so do you want to give as uh, we have discussed too much about yes, the insulin resistance agenthesis and all and all then do you think there is the role of insulin sensitizer in your patient Yes, ma'am. Of course, there is a rule of uh, insulin sensitizers. As by improving the insulin sensitivity, we will decrease the circulating androgen levels. We will increase the ovulation rate, and there will be improved glucose tolerance. Therefore, there will uh, there will be improved uh, uh, follicular genesis and better pregnancy rates. So, along with ovulation induction, which type of the drug do you like to add for the uh, decreasing the insulin resistance? Ma'am, we can also add uh, to decrease insulin resistance. We can use metformin or inositols. Uh, Ma'am, metformin are bioguanides uh, which uh, increase the uptake of glucose into the cells and decrease gluconeogenesis, and they also increase insulin sensitivity at post receptor level. Thus, uh, overall, they will decrease the insulin resistance, but they have more GI side effects. And uh, we start with the uh, we start with 500 mg od and then we can increase on weekly basis by 500 mg od we should at least give it for 3 to 6 months metformin should be given for at least 3 to 6 months what is the other benefit of metformin uh, it is uh, reducing the insulin resistance other than that any other benefit of the metformin yes ma'am ma'am uh, metformin is also helping in in restoring spontaneous ovulation and uh, according to latest studies it improves ovulation as well as clinical pregnancy rates anything else ma'am metformin yes ma'am in obese female metformin can help in uh, decreasing weight loss and spontaneous uh, spontaneous uh, ovulation fine and how the mannistol uh, acts yeah dr alpna uh, i would like to know whether she wants to add metformin routinely in all pcos cases no ma'am uh, ma'am metformin should be added if the patient is obese and it should it according to latest trials uh, it works if there is impaired glucose tolerance is there then i would like to add it and, uh, and even if she is uh, letrozole or clomiphene resistant then also you can add yes ma'am i would like to add it ma'am and metformin also is the reducing the chances of ohs development OHS. so if there is a multi follicular development during the follicular monitoring then you can add the metform so how the mannistol acts Uh, ma'am, my inositol helps in uh, increasing the glucose uptake and increasing the FSH signaling. Thus, uh, it helps in follicular genesis. It also uh, decreases the insulin-mediated androgen production. Yeah, but it is currently it... under trial, and uh, so... but still we have uh, enough literature to say my inositol is a safe and the good drug, yes, and we are getting the good result with the my inositol. So either of the metformin or the my inositol can be added in the ovulation induction protocol. So suppose the first line metformin and this clomiphene letrozole doesn't work in this patient. Then what is next for this patient? Ma'am, uh, we can use gonadotropins. Ma'am, gonadotropins are the second line ovulation induction agent, and they are used if there uh, if the, there are three failed cycles with letrozole, clomiphene citrate, or clomiphene citrate along with metformin. So which protocol of the gonadotropin uh, do you like to give in your patient? As ma'am, uh, in PCOS patient, there is high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. So I would like to go with low dose step up regime, in which we keep a very low starting dose of thirty seven point five to fifty international unit FSH, and then uh, we'll give it for seven days. And if the follicle size is still less than ten mm, then we can add on thirty seven point five international unit more. And after seven days, we'll again repeat the scan to see the follicular size. in such a way we can in keep on adding the dosage and maximum dose that we can give is 225 uh, international units so what But counseling the, you are going to do to your patient when you are putting her on gonadotropin cycle uh, ma'am i would uh, i would like to inform her about the danger signs of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome if she has pain abdomen or uh, or abdominal distension vomiting nausea Uh, decrease your in output she should report immediately 
frequent monitoring long cycle these are the things also you have to discuss because they are the working uh, important yeah. case awesome. in, uh, these patients even if you are planning iui and you are using very low dose gonadotrophins they are at risk of ohss oh, you have yes. to explain that then that uh, maybe you need to uh, cancel the cycle or sometimes you have to convert the cycle to ivf and IVF also. Also. so okay. the counseling part is very important yes yeah. and this should be done in a tertiary care center under supervision Yes, should also every time it should be under supervision of the consultant. Okay. So we have discussed the complication. Okay. Yes, Fine. So what could be the life threatening complication of OHS? Why we are too much scared and discussing metformin gave before this, this, that to avoid the OHS? Uh, Ma'am, uh, OHSs can cause uh, ovarian rupture. Uh, leading to hemorrhage uh, the patient can go can land up in shock also uh, due to uh, uh, fluid loss into extravascular spaces there is, there is hypovolemia and hypercoagulable state develops so we are afraid of dvt and other side effects patient might need the icu care also develop yes, the ideas renal failure and the yes, dvt so don't take it lightly yes ma'am so patient is the developing ohs on the gonadotropin clomiphene letazole all are failed in this case so what yes. next can you do? Ma'am, the next we can do is laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Uh, it, uh... Uh, but before going to laparoscopic ovarian drilling, I would like to know that this patient, you have started on gonadotrophin cycle. So what are the indications when you're going to cancel the cycle that uh, no will not yeah. go? Yeah, ma'am, ma uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am would like to cancel the cycle if uh, we suspect a large number of intermediate size follicles, like um, between 10 How many follicles? And... How many follicles? How many follicles? How many follicles? Ma'am, five follicles more than 10 mm hmm. or three follicles more than 15 mm. Hmm. So we, then we have to cancel or if the estradiol level has risen rapidly or more than 20 mm. It is 1500. It is 1500 for IUI when you are planning IUI. This is for uh, IVF you are telling me. Fine. For IVF it is 4500. No, no. That madam is, madam is yes. for the more than 1500 in the IUI cycles. Yes. Usually we don't do the estrogen level because not available in the hospital and it is a costly patient usually not affording and we are just going by the seeing the size of the and the number of the follicles. But the value of the estrogen is whatever the madam is telling. Okay. Yeah, and you know that when the follicle size is more than 14 millimeter, then roughly approximately you can calculate 200 picogram yes, per sir. ml yes, and sir. then accordingly you know the uh, approximate value of the Value yeah. of estrogen. Yes, very good point told by the madam. You have to see the how many follicles and the size accordingly you can calculate because one follicle is around the 150, 200 to 150 in the if the more than 14 to 16 mm. Fine. So these are the indication of the laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Just in the short term, how how to do the laparoscopic ovarian drilling? Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, in the laparoscopy ovarian drilling, unipolar current should be used. And installation of normal saline into the purity to enhance ovarian cooling because of the heat. What is the rule of thumb? What is the rule of thumb for the laparoscopic ovarian? Uh, when there is a rule of four is used, where 40 watt is used for four seconds and four punctures, not mean? more than that. Okay, fine. So, uh, do you think it is uh, better than the gonadotropin laparoscopic ovarian drilling? Yes, ma'am, because in LOD, uh, the extensive monitoring is not required and also there are reduced risk of multiple follicles and OHSs. There are lower uh, incidence of multiple pregnancy, and, but similar live birth rates between the two, between the LOD and uh, gonadotropins and lots of lower treatment and delivery cost. So this is the permanent treatment for the PCOS if you uh, have done no, the LOD? No, not permanent because after LOD we have we'll advise the couple to get pregnant within uh six to twelve months because after this again uh again the it same complaints will arise and again anovulation and infertility. The laparoscopic ovarian drilling you're not going to do in each and every case. It is an invasive yes, procedure. Yes, ma'am. You have to decide. Suppose the patient is planned for laparoscopy, then yes, you can offer her or she's lean, LH is high. Or she comes from far off, gonadotropin monitoring is not possible. So there are certain cases and not all the cases you will go for gonadotropin uh, vis a vis uh, laparoscopic. Yeah. 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 Either patient is not affording for the IVF and resistant to the clomiphene developing OHS with the gonadotropin, then you can plan the laparoscopic yeah. ovarian because uh, definitely the risk of GA is a very invasive procedure. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
So, Preeti, in spite of all, she is not conceived. She has not conceived. Then what next in your basket for this patient? Oh, ma'am, I would like to go with artificial reproductive technique. Uh, that is VRT. Uh, it is third line option for the management of infertility. So which protocol do you give in the PCOS? Uh, ma'am, I would like to give GNRH antagonist protocol. As there is the decreased duration of stimulation, uh, so there is decreased incidence of OHSS. And uh, there is decreased total gonadotropin dose, which is a costly drug, and therefore it is quite beneficial. Uh, in PCOS, mainly due to increased risk of OHSS, we will prefer the GNRS antagonist protocol. Fine. So we will not go to the IVF cycle because I don't think time permits us. So, but one thing just to add on that yeah. since these patients are at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. You have planned for freeze all. You are giving antagonist. The advantage with antagonist is you can use agonist trigger and go for freeze all cycle. Yes, and in such cases, since she's at risk of OHSS, you can continue with antagonist mm -hmm. for next three to five days so that rapid lutealysis occurs. That also prevents OHSS. Yeah. Yes. yes. So freeze all is a very good technique for this in these cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. So what uh, what could you do for the male factor, Mahua? Ma'am, uh, for the male factor, I would like to do intra intrauterine insemination for this couple. Okay. So how how do you think that it will it is going to help in the uh, treatment of infertility? Uh, Ma'am, because uh, IUI it enhances uh, it ensures better quality and more number of sperms enter the uterine cavity. And it is uh, timed near the ovulation and ensures good chances of fertilization. Because uh, here, semen washing processes, uh, it improves, removes the uh, debris and leukocytes and non viable sperm uh, spermatocytes. And uh, it uh, concentrates the one, uh, concentrates the motile spermat sperms. So uh, it bypasses the cervix and also it increases the chance of fertilization. So, if the concept of anti sperm antibodies exists, then it also the can be avoided by the IUI. Okay. Yes, so tell us the indications and the contraindications of IUI. Uh, Ma'am, uh, for uh, males, uh, mild uh, oligospermia, then uh, ejaculatory or irritable dysfunction, hypospadias. If the semen is highly viscous, then we can use in uh, females, if vaginismus or ovulatory dysfunction, mild endometriosis or in unexplained infertility. So can you tell us anything about the in which cases are we are going for the donor semen IUI? Yes, ma'am. Uh, donor, uh, donor semen IUI is used in azospermia, azospermia patients with the testicular failure, or if the severely abnormal semen parameters are present, or in if some if there are any hereditary disease in the male partner, or any uh, recess ISO immunization in women, or IVF XC unaffordable for the couple, then we can offer the donor semen IUI. And what about the HIV discordant couple? If the wife is negative HIV and husband is the positive, then? Yes, ma'am. Then also we can offer donor. Uh, in every case IUI. of the HIV discordant couple, do you go for the donor IUI or can you do something for the couple also by their own uh, sperms? Can you try the IUI? Mm -hmm. By doing some CD4 count, can it will make you wiser? Yeah, if the viral load is less than 50 in the male for the six months, then after this uh, spa, semen wa washing, chances of the transmission of HIV is very less. In that condition, you can do the IUI, but you have to take the consent. It is not the zero percent risk of the transmission but can iui can be done in that condition and that iui or the unprotected coitus even can also be done for just for the sake of pregnancy if the six months viral load is less than 50. yeah and just to add on uh, just to yeah. go back to the previous slide like if the couple is having severely abnormal semen parameters and even in azospermia with testicular failure you can offer uh, ivec uh, ICSI with the uh, testicular TZ, uh, it can be done. Yes. So it can be tried. You have to do counseling. You can't uh, offer directly uh, down Don't. to the same yeah. yeah, yeah. Even in hereditary disease, yeah. you have to explain that, yes, there's a risk that if you have a son, then this disease may be passed on to the son if you want to try on your own, like in clean filter. Yeah. 
So that counseling is very important. Directly, you cannot offer donor semen IUI in all cases. So after the uh, understanding of the consequences, then if they opt, that yes, is the yes. choice. Okay. That is important. And the PZD, pre-genetic testing facilities also available. Madam is doing in the IVF center. So you can send them also for the PZD. Oh, they are not yet started at ESI. But you will do it soon, madam. <laughs> we will send the patient of the donor IUI to you. <laughs> Fine. So could you tell us what are the recent changes in the ART bill about, about the sperm and the OVA donation? in the RT bill? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in the recent, ma'am, there is only supply of gamut of a single donor to only one commissioning couple has been added. And the semen donor age is the 21 to 55 years old. And the oocyte donor is 23 to 35 year old. Ever married woman having at least one alive child of her own. And she can only donate one oocyte and only a maximum of seven oocyte can be retrieved. So one oocyte for and the one sperm for the one yes. couple, no? not more than that. Like oh, earlier, no. we don't know about the donor semen going to how many couples. Okay, fine. So content indication just in the brief tell Mawa so, so we can discuss the tubal factor also. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in bilateral block tubes or severe uh, severe abnormality in the semen parameters like severe oligo or severe, severe oligospermia or severe teratosospermia in the maternal, uh, advanced maternal age or multiple previous failure uh, of IUI, then we should not. So could you tell us which method of the uh, sperm preparation you, uh, are you going to use in your patient? Because it's a case of oligo spermia. Uh, Ma'am, I'd like to go with the density gradient method. Uh, it, wo it works uh, it works according to the density uh, density uh, uh, density principle because the non viable sperm have low density and and, uh, and the viable sperms have higher density than the uh, leukocytes and non viable sperm so there are two uh, medium are used in this method and uh, centrifuged and the uh, viable sperm they co collect in the pellet so the maximum viable sperm so you would like to go for the double density yes. gradient method Fine. yes so i think this is the clear for all ioa should be done after the 34 to 36 hours of the seg trigger and 0.3 to 0.5 ml prepare semen should be instilled not more than that otherwise it will lead to the cramps in the female and it will lead to the whatever the you are instilling will, will become retrograde and you have to give the progesterone support and advise them to the coitus and check the UPT after the 15 days. So that much we have to do in the part of the IY. Suppose they have, uh, there is any history suggestion of the TV. So what could be the possible cause of infertility in that case? Ma'am, in case of TV, we can suspect tubal factor infertility, but in that case, mm -hmm. uh, hysterosalpicograph would be abnormal. It will show a uh, blocked tubes okay. or something like that. So what could be the causes of tubal factor infertility? Um, I mean, uh, I mean in, our, uh, uh, in our country, the most common cause is genital TB. And then when PID is the second most common causes and the increase the increased chance of a tubal factor infertility increases with the number of PID episodes. Then when septic abortion, endometriosis, grade three and four, previous tubal surgery or ectopic pregnancy or any rupture, ectop, uh, rupture appendix in the previous in the past, can the also thorough history of the infectious disease and the features of the endometriosis or any previous surgery or topics should be always taken the detail to rule out the tubal factor. Yeah, can so you quickly tell what are the contraindications of HST? Very important for yeah. all postgraduates. Yes, ma'am. Ma active yeah, active infection, or if uh, if we know that the patient is a uh, patient has uh, genital TB, or ma'am, uh, in case of undiagnosed. Uh, in case the patient is pregnant now, uh, we would not do it. And also if there is allergy to contrast. Yeah, and if you find any adenexal mass, in that case, laparoscopy is preferred. Uh, try yes. to avoid HST because it may be TO mass which may flare up or endometrioma which can turn into abscess. Fine. So what are the various tests for the tubal factor uh, infertility? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma we can go with the hysterosalpingography, which is the most commonly used. Then second is sonohistrosalpingography, which is uh, which uses saline uh, saline infused sonography. Then, um, then there is ma'am hycosy, which is hysterosalping or contrast sonography. Here we use contrast based sonography. 
then my phalloposcopy and the and the gold standard is the laparoscopy with chromo perturbation fine so high cost is better than the hsg uh ma'am uh yes ma'am it is um, it it uses contrast and it is so uh, it uses ultrasound because hysterosalpingography is it is a in uh, more invasive than hycosy in yeah. hycosy you only uh, infuse the contrast and ultrasound is done but you don't have a documented report yes ma'am in uh, yes whatever you are seeing live is the your perception so you cannot take the opinion from other also so hsg is the recorded version and that is the Uh, time tested technique for the ruling out of the tubal factor in first instance but suppose there is a bilateral corneal block in the hsg so do you um, rely on that finding or do you want to do something else ma'am uh, we will uh, we'll go with a uh, diagnostic gold standard that is a uh, laparoscopy with chromo perturbation what could be the cause of the bilateral corneal uh, block in cases of hsg what are the differential for that ma'am it can be due to corneal spasm and um, it can be due to mucus plug which is impacting the other osteo cornea corneal you have to rule out tuberculosis in indian setting if it is bilateral corneal block yes ma'am yeah but maybe because of the corneal spasm due to the pain whatever the dry yeah, urine spilling into the hsg so it is also very common and many time in the laparoscopy we see the it is a bilateral tube doing the hysteroscopy we see the sub bilateral so bilateral uh, tubal block then you have to definitely go for the laparoscopy and definitely laparoscopy is the gold standard so could you tell the surgeries what could be performed to do the and uh, how uh, what are the further investigation you want to say the patient if it is not uh, feasible to go for yes. the tubal surgery yes ma'am uh, we can we have uh, tubal cannula option ma'am in surgical options we have tubal cannulation uh, tubal uh, recanalization a uh, reversal of sterilization uh, we can do for distal segment we can do fimbriolysis or fimbrioplasty also the neosalping ostomy we can do uh, in case when there is hydrosalping uh, then we must do clipping of uh, the tube uh, before doing ibf as the fluid in hydrosalping is uh, embryotoxic and it will affect the um, uh, endometrium negatively decreasing the pregnancy rate Uh, but the ma'am uh, success rate of tubal surgeries is very less so uh, better option is to go for ivf in if there is moderate to severe tubal blockage so even after the successful tubal surgery if she is not conceiving within the 6 months or the maximum to the 1 year then you have to move for the other option because success rate of the tubal surgery is uh, quite low yes so just this is a hot burning topic art in the surrogacy bill So, Priti, could you tell us what are the changes done in the surrogacy bill? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the eligible couples are Indian infertile couple who is legally married uh, with Indian male in the age group of twenty six to fifty five years and female in the age group of twenty three to fifty years. They should have been. They must have been married for at least five years, and uh, they uh, they uh, should have a medical condition which is necessary to take the surrogacy and who do not have a child. or has life threatening fatal disease widow or divorcee female can also be eligible who is not eligible single or divorced men single unmarried women couple in live in relationships uh, foreign couples or uh, lgbtq intending parents uh, these are not uh, these are not eligible for so earlier it was the become the fashion Yes, ma'am. So have a surrogacy by the single male or the female, but now the law is very strict, and we have to be comply with the law. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And important is they should have their own gametes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who can be the surrogate mother as per this law? Ah, uh, ma'am, the woman should be ever married in the age group of twenty five to thirty five years on day of implantation, and she must have a child of her own, and she must be willing for the same. Ah. Uh, Uh, she can do it only once in lifetime and uh, she must have a certificate of medical and psychological fitness from registered medical practitioner yeah. now they have to approach the board <laughs> okay a, a certificate for uh, uh, surrogacy yes ma'am so they want to the certificate keep the certificate yeah they need the certificate uh, now the things are changing so how the certificate will help them that they are eligible for surrogacy now the surrogacy boards are being formed yeah yeah have them so they'll have to 
go to the uh, uh, board and then uh, fitness and other uh, affidavits and that. Okay, uh, fine. So it will be difficult to get the surrogate also. Yeah. Like the donors, like the crisis of donor in the society. Now these altruistic surrogacy is allowed. So uh, maybe from the relatives of the same age. Yeah. yeah. This is the good thing. Relatives will come for the help to the relatives and really? altruistic surrogacy will be the yeah. good concept, I think. So what is that altruistic surrogacy, Preeti? Ma'am, uh, altruistic surrogacy helps in preventing exploitation of the uh, mother, surrogate mother and the children. It uh, allows only the following arrangement for the surrogate mother in form of medical expenses and such other prescribed expenses incurred on the sur surrogate mother and also the insurance coverage. For how long insur insurance coverage? For uh, two years. 16 months, I think. 16 months. 16 months. So no charge, no fee, no remuneration and expenses. Fine. So thank you. We are just on time 8.30 in my phone. So <laughs> we just rushed the later part of the discussion. But uh, this is a PG forum and this is the basic evaluation of infertility is too long and exhaustive. So we have to discuss the important points like the male factor or little factor and the tubal factor. Three cornerstones we have touched. It is difficult to touch the cryo preservation or what the gamete uh, preservation and ART it is difficult. So we have to, Madam Dr. Shivani is here joined. Please yeah, keep yeah. the uh, uh, two, three classes on this topic. It is very, very difficult for the moderators to uh -huh, <laughs> manage the one exactly. class. ART okay. we have not discussed. That is also the very cornerstone and the very good opportunity for the couples. Nowadays yeah. it is very common and the good results also we are getting in the IVF, not the IUI doing but not getting the results. That is very disappointing for the clinician as well as the couples. Definitely, we will keep this in mind, madam. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Lina is here to... Yeah, yeah, it's a very big topic, although uh, so much has been covered in one hour. <laughs> That's really great. The PGs have also done very well. Yeah, they have did very hard work because yeah. they have to read everything. Preeti and Mahua, both of you have done a fantastic job. It was great Thank you so much, to ma'am. Tell you all the questions. You were all ready. Great. So on, uh, on behalf of uh, AOGD and the Delhi PG Forum, I would like to congratulate the entire team for this uh, beautiful session. Uh, all the basics and all the things that the PGs must know, they have been covered. And I would like to really thank our chairperson, Dr. Lena, who has spared her valuable time for us. And she has also given valuable inputs from time to time. And we also would like to thank our excellent moderators, Dr. Uh, Alpana and Dr. Alpita, and of course, uh, the PGs uh, who have really toiled hard to uh, give this class uh, a good performance. So uh, last but not the least, our, uh, we would like to thank Jackson Pal, our academic partner uh, who have uh, given this uh, nice platform for this class. And uh, our next class is on uh, 17th April. It is on uh, postpartum hemorrhage. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Lina time. and my co-moderator, Dr. Arpita, for the very good inputs. I learned something new today. And thanks, my PGs. Fantastic you, job done by you. Thank you, Jackson Paul, for giving the platform to discuss. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. And uh, just a quick uh, recap of uh, the products that Jackson Paul is uh, having. This is Divatron tablet of uh, Didrogestrone 10mg tablets. These uh, also got an award last year. Uh, so this was a AVAX Marketing Excellence Award that we got last year at Mumbai, November 2022. So requesting your support to uh, Divatron for natural as well as assisted conception. We also have Hydroxyprogesterone Caprate as injection maintained. 250 and 500 mg and Lycorate, the ultimate cell protector, the antioxidant that you may require 
Also, lipo-red break sachet, which has uh, L-arginine, lycopene, and DHA for high-risk pregnancy. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, next, we have a program this Wednesday, which is the Art and Science of Birthing. This is a series which is going on. This is part three. Isopa Prayagraj is doing this. Apart from this, of course, our uh, monthly PG forum, we look forward to that as Dr. Shivani just said, postpartum hemorrhage next month. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.